<laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> it's okay, sis. It's okay. Damn, damn, damn. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Welcome to another edition of Second Stage Sports Zoom style. <laughs> Oh, and while, uh, it's, it's, all right, all right, okay. All right, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. My name is Lakita McGee. You can follow me at Keita McGee on the Twitter and at Keita underscore McGee on the IG. <laughs> As I try to compose myself, I am Sydney Brown. You can follow yours truly on the Twitter in the IG at SidK80. Once again, at SidK80. That's S I D K I D 80. That's S I D K I D 80. You can follow the show on at War Media at W A R R Media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And you can check out all our show and also some other great shows. Also, this show is also going to be released via YouTube on the same day we record this every Monday night. And also on Tuesday, you'll get the audio version on Anchor, Google, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts, including iHeartRadio and the iHeartRadio app. Make sure to check us out. And also, so you can follow us on all social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and right here on YouTube at War Media. Once again at WAR Media. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you very much in advance for your support. Like, share, subscribe, and tell your friends. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. And we are unapologetically fun, Lakina. <laughs> As we start out with baseball, let's go to the south side of town. Yours truly was there on Sunday, sitting in section 108. There, there, Sid. During the, during the makeup of the first game. Uh, cruel. Yeah, uh, baseball. <laughs> the baseball guys are just cruel to us, the White Sox fans. Why? I don't know. What the hell did we do wrong? <laughs> what did we do wrong? Versus Eloy, Adam Engel, mm -hmm. Billy Hamilton, Luis Robert. And then, of course, on Sunday, Jose Abreu freakishly got hit by a pitch that injured his left knee. He is day to day. Thank goodness that the X-rays came back negative following Sunday's game. Of course, the White Sox split the doubleheader against the Mariners on Sunday. We'll review that series in just a moment. But Lakina, I, I, I saw the play. He went down hard, as you can expect. I thought he busted his knee because we've seen that before mm -hmm. through history. These things, unfortunately, happen. But I said, uh, we, I was talking to a few fans around me. How we talked about how this team is still good. You know, despite all the injuries, and then five minutes later, Jose Bray gets hit on his knee. It's like, damn, <laughs> <laughs> what else could happen now? Well, look, the good news Why? is, it, but the good news is, it looks like, you know, like you said, he's day to day. He may have to be on the IL for, for maybe you know the two weeks just to sort of make sure you know he's all set. Mm -hmm. And I and I think, look, you were able to pull it out in that second game because. I was getting a little bit worried after you lost that first game of that doubleheader. And unfortunately, you end up losing the series to a Mariners team, which they're okay, but they're not great. So, uh, unfortunately, you weren't able. You kind of fell into, you know, the bad habits. You know, the, the middle relief didn't do so well. I mean, you know, missed opportunities, you know, on the hitting side. So, it was just not just not a very good series. All the, look, you're going to have these kind of series where – you're going to lose to a team, lose a series to a team that you have no business losing to. I think people need to, you know, I think Sid, I'm trying to console Sid here because he, because <laughs> I'm sure there are all other White Sox fans that are feeling the same way he does and want to, you know, jump off the ledge. Calm down. You're lucky you're playing in the AL Central. You're still about a game and a half up on the Indians, you know, who didn't, they didn't have a good weekend either. So, you know, that's a, probably a good thing. Yeah, I think I think you know people need to you know they're they're up two and a half right now still with the Indians out of this recording. So I wouldn't say they lost their their weekend series. So I would say don't I would advise you know some White Sox fans not to freak out just yet. First of all, I'm not freaking out because as I said before, this White Sox team should be fine, and I'm not going to jump off the bandwagon and say Rick Hahn needs to make a deal right now. I'm still going to stick to that. It is going to be closer to the deadline when he makes a, a deal. Right now, the asking price for whoever he wants to bring to the team is too high. The other teams are asking for the boat, I'm sure, and he's, I'm sure he's telling them no. What I'm mad about is that Jose Abreu, why does it have to happen to him? 
Why? I, I, I don't get it, but, it, but I, I'm not panicking. I, I'm not going to jump off the bridge. Like I said, this, this is still a good team. But once and if and once everybody else, everybody else comes back to the lineup healthy, this team should take off and and play to the capabilities that they they are able to play. Like you mentioned, Lakina Cleveland, uh, they still hang around. As we told you guys before the season, they will be the most competitive team to threaten the White Sox to take this division. I thought just like everybody else was going to be the Twins, but the Twins are having a bad year. Even though they're having a recent hot streak, I know they're playing the White Sox as we speak in a four game series on the South Side. We'll get into that a, li- a little bit, but I'm still not too worried about this White Sox team. I'm not saying Rick Hahn needs to make a deal right now. It's not going to happen, folks. It's going to be closer to the deadline, and so uh, we just have to be patient with that. I know patience is a dirty word to some people, including yours truly at times, but you just have to wait because if you're Rick Hahn, as we said before, we'll keep saying this until July 31st. We got technically uh, a month now before the trade deadline. You have to be patient. You cannot make the wrong deal like, i.e., Fernando Tatis Jr. a few years ago for James Shields. You, you can't do that anymore. The White Sox don't have a lot in their farm system. So they're not as bad as the, the Cubs. We'll get to them later. But they don't have as much as you think in their farm system. So if you're Rick Hahn, you're not going to give away all of your prime talent for a rental player for two months or a, a year or two months. This is not going to happen. Yeah, and I, and I think, look, the good news is, is that thank goodness for, you know, Mercedes. You know, we got, had three RBIs in that game, you know, and then the rubber match on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Zach Collins also have uh, four RBIs. I think that's a career high for him. So I think you were able to kind of write the shit there and, you know, kept yourself from getting swept because that really would have been bad if you were mm-hmm. if you're a White Sox fan. But, again, I mean, you know, you're going into some pitching issues. Unfortunately, you had the, the bad weather issues that hit on Saturday. We had a lot of storms that hit our area. And of course, you know, the games had to be, you know, had to do a day-night double, had a, a double header, I should say, on Sunday. Didn't do any well with the first double header. And we'll, we'll get to what happened during that first double header game because there were some other things that happened that got some headlines. <laughs> 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 oh, boy. Just crazy. We'll get to that in a minute. But I, I mean, look. It's, it's unfortunate that they had to – yes, they should have swept the Mariners at the very least won the series. But, look, in the 162-game series, you're going to have these type of series where they're going through a funk right now. Some of the injuries are starting to kind of catch up to the White Sox a little bit. Look, you're, look, you're, you're still a couple of games up on the Indians. Like I said, luckily you're playing in the, in the AL Central, I should say. And I'm not, I'm not worried about it either. I think people need to kind of just chill for a second and just – Look, it's a, it's, it's an up, it ebbs and flows. You know, the baseball season ebbs and flows. Mm-hmm. So I think people need to kind of, White Sox fans need to kind of just chill for a little bit. You're listening to Second City Sports along with Lakina McGee, which is she. I am Sydney Brown. That's me as we talk about the Chicago White Sox. Lakina, let's go to Yermin Mercedes. Of course, he had a good day on Sunday. He had a hit in the first game. He had a three RBI performance in the nightcap. As we talked about for the last couple episodes, Lakina, Yermin Mercedes, a.k.a. the Yerminator, mm-hmm. was pressing. And ever since that quote-unquote incident in Minnesota uh, early last month, he only, he's only had two home runs, and his average dropped to around 270 for, uh, for the season around there somewhere. It looks like he's starting to pick it up. Him and Tony LaRusso, the manager, embraced each other following their victory on Sunday. Now, instead of a, a sign of thing, good things to come, let's hope so, because as we talked about it before, Yermin has been pressing, and uh, the opposing pitchers uh, know how to get him out. Yermin is looking for the fastball, and when the fastball is especially high and tight, and you swing and miss at it, expanding your strike zone, you're not going to get too many hits. Just take what the pitcher's give you and he did that on Sunday like I said before I think he just needed to look I think pitchers were figuring them out and he needed to kind of like take mm-hmm. a step back I know people want to make a big deal about what happened you know about a month ago with some of the comments that Lewis made about him did that kind of you know affect his psyche maybe it did you know who knows he's like look he's a young guy I think look he's still this is his first full season the majors so I think people need to kind mm-hmm. of like you know chill with the you know the, the weirdness of it so I think look I know it's the Mariners but look if you get three three RBIs 
you know, yes, the pitching for the Mariners isn't very good, but, you know, again, you can kind of like sort of, you know, you can't help what you play your schedule. I think you can kind of write the ship now. We'll see what happens when he starts playing against some of the tougher competition, tougher pitching in the AL, and we'll see if he's really back. And going back to the Jose Abreu injury, as of right now, it, it, uh, it's not in the two series other than his day-to-day. For the sh- for the short term, uh, you'll you'll see Yasmani Grandal and Andrew Rob Vaughn playing uh, some first base. Maybe Jacob Lamb occasionally here and there, but it depends on the lineup uh, and the posted pitcher for for that day. But in the short term, I think it's going to work with the combination of those two, perhaps three players uh, throwing in Jacob Lamb. But uh, for the long term, Lakina, I'm with you. Uh, you uh, even though Jose Abreu, we talked about in our last episode, uh, he's had a, the worst June of his career. He's still a big bat in that lineup, and with this injury, you need to get him right. You could take all the time that you need to heal him properly. I'm sure he's going to DH a few games as soon as he comes back, but he's a big bat that, that's going to be heard from from this lineup, assuming that you're going to uh, get some other key guys back in the next coming weeks here. So in the short term, I like Yasmani Grandal and Andrew Vaughn, who was drafted a couple years ago. He was the replacement. Um, for Jose Abreu at first base, assuming that Jose Abreu didn't sign that contract a couple years ago. So I think in the short term, uh, they'll be fine at first base. Rick Hahn does not need to go out and make a deal for first base. They're not out there like that. So people that want to him, Rick Hahn, to make a deal for first base, that's not going to happen, folks. Let it go. Mm-hmm. So uh, for the short term, I like Gr- the combination of Grandal and Vaughn at first base and occasionally Jacob Lamb. But for the short, t- short term, I like it. But in the long term, assuming that Jose Abreu gets healthy, gets right, uh, it, it, he's still going to be heard from before the season concludes. And I think, you know, look, the good news is, is that you have a lot of depth there, like you said, so that can play first base for Abreu until whenever he comes back, whether it's next week or whether it's two weeks from maybe 10, ten days from now. Mm-hmm. You're in a pretty good spot if you're the White Sox. Now, in the first game of that doubleheader, which unfortunately, you know, the White Sox lost that the lost game, one of that doubleheader, three to two. It was, you know, something that happened with uh, Hector Santiago. And apparently, if you guys saw it, um, apparently, I guess they checked his glove. You know, they say that he had some weird substance in the glove, but he swears that it's sweat and rosin, which is something that pitchers use to kind of like, you know, be able to kind of like grip their hands in the glove. Mm-hmm. So, but of course, you know, the, they said it was something else and he got kicked out and all heck broke loose. And it's just, this going to be a weekly thing, Sib, where someone's going to get ejected, you know, for, you know, weird substance in wherever in parts of their body or parts of their gloves, you know, these pitchers and I, I'm just like, okay, this is going to be a thing now. Like, this is just, a, just, just the absurdity of it all. It's just completely ass nine. <laughs> How dumb can you be, B, B? You know that this rule has been in place officially now for about a week. And you still going to try to do some slick stuff, thinking you can get away with it? What's wrong with you? Now, here's my suggestion to MLB Commissioner Rod Manfred. You know how in basketball and hockey, and I believe football, football, uh, uh, football too, um, when you go through replay or you go through a bad call, you announce it over the PA speaker. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yes, sir. Can we do the same thing for baseball? The reason why I say that because, like I mentioned, I was at the game Sunday. I had to turn on my phone and turn on social media to find out that he was kicked out. <laughs> Can you make a big announcement to the crowd, please? Oh, so y'all didn't. Yeah, know. or at least oh. put it on the scoreboard. Can you do that, please? Oh, okay. So y'all didn't know that uh, that he was ejected. Okay. The people there didn't know, apparently. Okay, so yeah, that's that's a big problem there, and it, it just got to the point where I'm 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 kind of like, okay, this is gonna be a thing where you're gonna have to deal with. You know, guys are going to get checked a lot, you know, for these pictures are going to be checked all over the place. Some guys are probably going to have to – we saw what happened with Scherzo last week. You know, we saw what happened to a couple yep. other pictures. We saw with Santiago. Sergio Romo. <laughs> oh, Lord, don't let's, – let's not, let's not rehash that. I mean, my right. God. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just unfortunate that they decided this – in the middle of the season to change a rule that's been in place for over 110 years or something like that. But yet, because like I said, I've been saying this the last couple of episodes, 
Home runs are down, and I think they need to garner some offense. And look, let's get rid of the thing that has made kind of like pitchers that they've used all this time. And now, okay, you know, this will help get the get the the batting averages up and the home runs up. <laughs> it hasn't so far, but again, we're only a week into this, so we'll let, we'll see what happens. Yeah, let's see if the office can come around. If you major league baseball knows is is on pace to have a historic or all time low as far as batting average and power numbers are concerned. You know, it's in all other sports. You, you you try to have have a balance between offense and defense in terms of the rules. Now we see in football is a big discrepancy. You definitely see that in basketball, hockey. They don't give a damn. Uh, we'll leave that alone. Mm-hmm. But in baseball, they're always trying to tweak things and trying to. Um, just try to shore up some things that can please their fan base. We all know that their fan base is much older. They're 45 mm-hmm. to 50 year old white men. And uh, they, they, I think my personal opinion, they're the worst out of the four major sports. They try to, uh, they try to, that they needs to appeal to a younger fan base. I know they try to uh, speed up the games, which has helped in some ways, but in, in most cases it, it hasn't. Uh, I know you had the. Uh, I know people are not talking about this rule anymore. But the uh, the intentional walk, you just throw one pitch outside, and they and the batter takes his base. But that doesn't help speed up the game. Uh, <clears throat> I, 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 if you're baseball, <clears throat> excuse me, what can you do at this point? I it, it, with this current rule with the sticky stuff. I think they're just making a bad example out of the, the pitchers uh, in Major League Baseball. Uh, will it go away? Not anytime soon, but I, I think baseball is just using these pitchers to to make their point about uh, the lack of offense, and that's why you see, uh, we we are looking at so many no hitters. Looking at with seven, if you include Madison Bumgarner, eight on this show mm-hmm. uh, that we saw the, uh, that we were already seeing this season. So uh, the baseball really. They're in the catch-22 right now, but they can't blame nobody but themselves. It'll be interesting to see what they do, especially when once we get out of the all-star break. Will offense, mm-hmm. will the offenses pick up? Will the battery, batting averages go up? Will the home run numbers go up? And we'll just have to wait and see. I, I just think that you know, you're kind of playing with fire here with baseball mm-hmm. and you know messing around with a formula that – pitchers have been using for years for the most part and now you're trying to say well we want you to do something completely different because the offenses are down well that's not the pitcher's fault you know that that's other things and I, I think people need to kind of and I think baseball like I said needs to recognize that and we'll see I mean I, I just think that they're I think they're bitten off more they can than they can chew if you're you know in, in the baseball sense but again that's just me <laughs> And also, too, I was listening to somebody about a day or so ago, and this person brought up a great point. How will this rule affect the trade down line? Because as we all know, starting pitching is at a premium, and veteran relievers um, are at a premium as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so well, it, it, it will have to depend on, on a particular player. If they're uh, without this sticky stuff, how are saying, how are the numbers being inflated? And if it if it's a significant drop, will that player be shipped off to another team? We don't know. I, you know, will, will that player get a second, a third, fourth look to go to a contending team? Who knows? Yeah, that's. I just I mean, thought it was very interesting. Yeah, definitely the million dollar question there, and we'll figure out as the season goes. Now let's go to the north side of town, Sid. And, you know, unfortunately, like the White Sox, the Cubs didn't have a good weekend series either. Of course, they were playing the Dodgers. You know, they lost three out of four. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, look, unfortunately, it's sort of evening out. I mean, I think, like, when they first started playing the Dodgers in series, I think they won, like, they, like seven or eight in a row. It's all kind of evening mm-hmm. out now. So, I'm not – look, I'm not too concerned. I mean, unfortunately, there have been some still some injuries. You know, the, the pitching has been kind of struggling, and they haven't mm-hmm. really been hitting very well either. And this is a, like like we've been saying, this is a tough part of the of the Cubs schedule, you know. And and right now, uh, 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 they're not getting a good grade. We had to uh, give an A, B, C, or D. You can give them a D at this point. Of course, they were they, they were uh, helped out by that uh, historic combined no hitter on Thursday. But uh, Friday's game, uh, uh, the, the Dodgers came through in the late innings. 
uh, Saturday's game, even though uh, Alec Mills didn't pitch great, he kept the Cubs in the ball game after giving up two early early runs. The Cubs did fight back, but uh, uh, their lack of offense has been a problem all year, and we saw it again in this Dodgers series. Of course, Cody Bellinger uh, hit the game winner in the ninth inning on, on Saturday. The Dodgers are starting to get uh, the, some of their guys back. So uh, the you saw that it paid dividends on Saturday, of course, uh, on Sunday night. Clayton Kershaw went back to the clock. Um, they, the the Cubs uh, struck out 14 times uh, in in the, in, the, in the three losses in that series. It, it, it was embarrassing if you were a Cubs fan. You still have the pitching, in particular the bull uh, a bullpen staff that is probably the best in the National League, but the starting pitching they can only do so much. And if you if you're the Cubs, you have an offense like the Cubs uh, that that are schizophrenic at best. It's going to be a problem. Now, Clayton Kershaw doesn't have it like he once did, but he did enough on Sunday night to give the win. I know people want to blame uh, Albert Azale, but I know he just returned from the DL from about a week and a half ago. So this was his second or third start start off the injured list. But I, I really don't blame him. Uh, it, it's a, a lack of a consistency from that Cubs office has been a problem uh, at times throughout the season. Look, I think we saw, we saw like, you know, two seasons ago, Clay Ker- Clayton Kershaw with 13 strikeouts. I mean, <laughs> look, I, ooh, look, as a layup, like I said, this is the first, his first game off the DL. I mean, the IL, I should say. So this is not, I'm not gonna mm-hmm. like freak out. Okay. Yeah. He gave up four runs. Well, but like we've been saying, the Dodgers are getting a lot of their guys back. They're starting to get back into their groove. I'm not worried about the Cubs. And they, yes, the Bre- I know people are freaking out because as of right now, the Brewers are mm-hmm. three games, but the Brewers are in the cream puff part of this schedule. That's mm-hmm. what they're benefiting from. Yeah, and the Cubs are playing the, and we've been saying this for the last couple of weeks, they're playing the tougher part of their schedule. So I'm not freaking out. They're playing right now. Uh, look, if you're the Cubs, I think this is a, you know, the perfect time. You're kind of mirror images of each other. This is a perfect time for the Cubs to kind of like get back into, you know, the swing of things or kicking it into gear. You're very similar, you know, Cubs and Brewers mm-hmm. are sort of like definitely a lot alike. So I think if this is the perfect time to, you know, write that ship, if you will, and we'll see if they can do it. I mean, look, they got to go in Milwaukee. You know, they've, they've had some good moments and some bad moments in Milwaukee <laughs> for the Cubs. So I'm not – hopefully we'll have some – you know, hopefully the Cubs will have some good moments. Yeah, if you're the Cubs, as we said before, this division is up for grabs right now. Currently, as of this recording, Milwaukee is up by three games, of course. Both these teams are doing battle as we speak at American Family Field. I still call it Miller Park. But <laughs> regardless of that, uh, assume that the Milwaukee Brewers sweep this series, which is very possible. I, I still don't think that the, this division is, is, is out of reach for the Cubs. I really don't think so because the Brewers, they're not a great team. As we said before this season, they're, they're the wild card in this division. I know I called it first. But you you see in it now, Brandon Woodruff is the one of the best pitchers in the National League. He's your definite All Star. Christian Yelich is having a good resurgence of a season. So you have other no name guys that are coming through with key hits. So is Milwaukee a good team? Yes. Are they going to blow you out the water? No. Look at uh, St. Louis and their struggles. They struggled with Pittsburgh uh, last weekend. So I'm not counting them out by any stretch. I know I had them. I had them as the division winner ultimately. Maybe it'll ultimately shake out that way, but. These top three teams in, in this uh, central NL Central Division, uh, they they're not going to overpower you, and they're not consistent. And so it, it's going to be a, a a big race to the finish. If you're the Cubs, if you could take at least two out of three, that shaves off a game, maybe two games. I think it shaves off two games, just so you'll be a, a game back. But mm-hmm. if you lose two out of three or get swept, you, I think the obviously you, you want to win every game, but ideally for the Cubs, just don't get swept. Yeah, I think ideally it's just, you know, just either don't get swept or try to win two out of three. I think that's if you're mm-hmm. – that way, you can, like you said, you still have a couple of games, you'll be only up, you know, only down one, I should say, going into your weekend series against Philly, another tough division, you know, tough team that you're going to be facing. So, like I said before, the reason why the Brewers are up three games, like I said, they're, they're playing the cream puff of the schedule right now. So, for anybody, any mm-hmm. Cubs fan there, they're say, see, see, the Cubs were – the Cubs were very good. I mean, the Cubs, you know, they're just a mirage. Milwaukee's very similar. The reason why – like I said, the reason why Milwaukee's up three, as of right now, you know they have not had to play. A, they're they're playing a, 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 the the cream puff part of the schedule. So I'm not gonna like freak out. Like oh my god, the Cubs are down three. Let's let's trade everybody. <laughs> no, don't do that because this this division is still very winnable. 
You're listening to Second City Sports along with Lakina McGee, which is she. I am Sydney Brown, which is me, as we continue to talk baseball. Lakina, uh, we'll all start with you, obviously. The best and worst from, from MLB from this past weekend. Uh, Mr. Shahei Otani. I mean, he continues to sort of just <laughs> like – just continues to just, you know, be, you know, most, you know, 50 strikeouts in a 25 home run season. He's logged on as of right now, 2,523 insistence in major league history of a 25 home run season. That just means that as combined strikeouts and 36 of those, which came from Bay Ruth. So he had already struck out 82 batters this season already. So he's just like, you know, you know, he he also hit two, which you know, he, you know, Joe Madden hasn't really had to depend on him to hit too much because you know the ages mm-hmm. aren't really going to go anywhere. But the fact that he's been able to do that at this point of the season, I mean, it's just amazing and just breaking all types of pitching records. It's just just to say what he's been able to do. He's your AL MVP right now. Oh yeah, I think I think so. I think I look. I I know some White Sox fans are saying, "Well, what about a you know what about a Brayu? What about Grandal? No, it's Otani. Otani is easily the AL MVP right now. And, and look, I think if if he, if he keeps it, keeps it up, he's gonna be an, he's gonna be an All Star. I I think. And if he keeps it up, I think. Yeah, I think he probably could be very well be your AL MVP. But again, still a long ways to go. Now, for the bad parts, I mean, oh, brother. And it, it's just like, oh, I, I, there's just, there really wasn't anything bad. I mean, yes, the Cubs lost three out of four, but again, I'm, it's the Dodgers. They're defending World Series champs, so I'm not worried about them. Um, I would say the Yankees, it, it, it's just like, I don't, just when you thought the Yankees <laughs> probably, just, you thought they were just starting to kind of like, okay, they're, mm-hmm. they, they, they pick up a couple of games, they're back, but then <sighs> they lose the, you know, they lose their series. And I, I just like, if you're Aaron Boone, I think you, what else, you know, you got injuries in your pitching staff. You really don't know what else you can do. You get swept by the Red Sox again. I, I just, yep. <laughs> I, I just, yeah, I just, there's really, there's nothing really more that you can say about the Yankees at this point. I mean, there's, there's six and a half back in a very competitive AL East. Could they write the ship? Sure, but they're going to have to figure it out and figure it out quick because we're running out of time before the All-Star break. What about you, Sid? Uh, I'll stick to your point with the Yankees. I did watch all three games of that series via my computer. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of things that came out to me. One, it looks like Gary Judge is starting to finally turn around. He had he had the only runs for the Yankees on Sunday with that two-run right shot in the them. sixth inning. Yep. Number two, Garrett Cole, you can say what you want to about this, uh, the sticky situation, no pun intended, but <laughs> you're talking about one of the, uh, the few pitches that have been clearly affected by this. It's been him. I watched that start that he had last Sunday at Boston. He did not look good. Yeah. He's still one of the best pitchers in the league, but ever since he made that comment, talking about he doesn't know about the sticky stuff. Uh, he hasn't used what uh, uh, he, he got called with it like a deer in headlights. He made those comments about two or three weeks ago. Uh, I don't think he's won a start since then. So no. uh, it, his struggles continued last Sunday. And Boston, I, I told you, I don't like their pitching staff. They have a nice offense with Rafael Devers and J.D. Martinez and uh, Johnny Verdugo. So I think their offense is going to keep them around. But I don't like their pitching staff. I really don't. I know they've been doing it with smoke and mirrors, but I don't like their pitching staff. But congrats to them. They pulled off a, a sweep, but the Yankees have not lost to them this year. They're 6-0. and And real quick, before we continue, mm-hmm. let's give the Arizona Diamondbacks two claps. <laughs> I think that was three. They broke their 24-game road losing streak by defeating the Padres on Saturday night. <laughs> Party! <laughs> I was so excited when I when I saw that. I'm like, thank God, like, cause they've gotten rid of like their their whole like their whole pitching staff. Yeah. So, I, I mean, look, they're still 29 out in the NL West, and they're they probably won't be a factor. But look, at least you don't have that record anymore. So, I guess that's the bright side. Yep. Also, too, the the Twins, as we mentioned, they are playing the White Sox as we speak uh, in the four-game series here on the south side of Chicago. Uh, they gave the Indians all they could handle uh, last weekend, of course. I did watch this series also, uh, the Battle of the Bay, all three games via my computer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oakland and San Francisco, they were very competitive games. Of course, uh, Oakland, 
uh, got away got away with the third game on Sunday, winning six to two. So they avoid being swept. Uh, call me crazy, Lakeen. These are a bunch of uh, uh, we called them the AARP team the last couple of years, but mm-hmm. uh, the Giants with a bunch of uh, older veterans and a bunch of no names. Uh, they're getting it done. It looks like they're not going away either. And is and the NL West uh, uh, race is going to get tighter and tighter as the season goes along. Well, my well, my other team that is the Padres, they've won nine of their last ten as of this recording, but they're still four and a half back because the Giants have played so well. And I think Gabe Kapler, I think, is making the case for NL Manager of the Year, especially if they can keep it up. Like you said, they they've got they've got like a lot of sort of familiar names, but like you like you also said that they're doing it with a lot of you know no name guys. So I I think look I say kudos to them, and we'll see how they are. They've been able to kind of weather the storm against the Dodgers and the Padres. Will that be the Will that be the same story the second half after the All Star break? We'll just have to wait and see. But right now they're they're not going away. Yeah, the San Francisco Giants are not going going away. We all thought they were going to be sellers just like the Cubs at the trade deadline but let's say they're going to be buyers as of right now uh will they get another bet will they get a a, a a starting pitcher that we don't know of that can help their that starting rotation we shall see but right now the San Francisco Giants have been one of the best surprise teams in baseball this season you listen to Legacy Sports along with Sydney Brown I'm Lakina McGee Sid let's go to the professional hardwood for a second um you want to start with the Western Conference or do you want to do Eastern Conference Finals first? Because the Western Conference uh, might let's... be over. The Western Conference Finals might be over by the, by the time this get this gets posted. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let, 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 let's go to the Western Conference because, like I said, this is probably the last time we break uh, break these games down uh, thoroughly. So let, let's start with the rest of the conference. Of course, uh, last. Uh, uh, last Saturday, uh, the Phoenix Suns took a commanding 3-1 series lead with an 84-80 victory against the Kawhi Leonard less uh, Los Angeles Clippers. Like uh, DeAndre Aiden led Phoenix with 19 points, 22 rebounds, three assists. Paul George led the Clippers with 23 points and 16 rebounds. Lakina, the second half, in particular the fourth quarter, was a dread to watch. Phoenix scored 15 points in the fourth quarter. The Clippers only 14. Uh, here's the thing. The Clippers, uh, they couldn't shoot worth a damn down the stretch. Uh, they were missing a lot of close shots, missing free throws. Uh, I don't think even, they even hit a three-point shot during the fourth quarter. So uh, the Clippers, uh, they, uh, I think the clock uh, struck midnight. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I you know, uh, they they had a he- heck of a run during these playoffs. They finally got to the Western Conference Finals for the first time in their franchise history. And so congratulations to, to them on that. It, it It's a foregone conclusion that Phoenix is going to the NBA Finals. As we talked about all season, uh, this team has been winning from day one until now. So and give head coach Monty Williams credit. Chris Paul has been a major difference uh, with that Suns team. As I told you guys, he was my MVP. Of course, he didn't get it. But with that being said, uh, this team has come together. Uh, you look at Mikel Bridges, you look at Campaign. We talked about him in our last episode. Yeah, he's, he filled in nicely through the first two games of this series against the Clippers. And, of course, Devin Book. I know people want to call him the next Kobe Bryant. Don't compare him to anybody else. And I'm being serious about this. He's the first Devin Booker, okay? He's, he's def- definitely become a, a top 10, top 5 player. Uh, in these playoffs. They're definitely a top five player in these playoffs. So Devin Booker, you got to give give it up to him. This Phoenix team is really coming together right now, and I won't be surprised if they win the whole thing. But uh, they they clearly shown that they're, they're the best team uh, in this series. Yes, the Clippers could have got out of there with a game two victory, but Phoenix has uh, taken advantage of all the breaks, and they've executed better, better than the Clippers uh, down the stretch in these games. And that's a big difference right now. Here's the weird thing. They were four for 20 from three, and they were able still able to win it. I mean, that, like, mm-hmm. that, like you said, that fourth quarter of game four was brutal. Like, you know, they were just missing mm-hmm. – people. everyone was missing shots all over the place. I think it might have been fatigue. Who knows? But as, mm-hmm. as, for, look, as for the um, the, the Clippers, I mean, look, a valiant effort by them. But once Kawhi hurt his knee, you know, whether or not it was ACL mm-hmm. or, may, or maybe just MCL, who knows? We still don't know the, the significance of it. But – you know, a lot of it, it just, it just, you know, you can tell that the Clippers just could have just went downhill after that. And, mm-hmm. and look, 
Paul George, I mean, he's tr- he's trying. Uh, I'll give him that, but it's not enough. Mm-hmm. Reggie Jackson, he's also trying. Again, that's not enough. Uh, Patrick Beverly, you know, where are you? Like, where 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 is he? I mean, Marcus, <laughs> Marcus Morris Senior. I'll give him Mulligan because he's ha- he's not one hundred percent. So I'll give mm-hmm. him that little bit of a Mulligan. Terrence Mann is back to being unfortunately Terrence Mann. Um, Batoon, I mean, where, where where are you, buddy? Demarcus Cousins, you're no help, unfortunately. You've been having been a, a big help, unfortunately. So it, it's just you know, and also too balanced score from the Suns. I mean, they've been you know, mm-hmm. of course, a has been able to help out CP3 and and Booker. And I think it's just that's kind of helped, you know, the scoring with the Suns. I think just a balanced scoring there. I mean, Sarek, you know, that hasn't been good, but you know, he's he's done some, you know, done some things. And like you said, campaign, you know, he's still a little banged up, but he's trying to do some things too. So again, by the time we you know come back and record on Friday, they may already be in the in the NBA finals. Mm-hmm. But again, you know, first days first, they got to win their game. You know, we'll see what they do. We'll have our, we'll have our synopsis about that game on Friday when we record again. But, you know, just, just, it's just been all suds. And it's just been unfortunate that, yes, it's going to be an asterisk here because, you know, that they're not without – equipment that don't, don't have Kawhi Leonard. But, again, the Suns, we've been telling you about the Suns all year. I think people kind of underestimated them. They're only, well, like, 50 to 1 shot to make the NBA Finals. Yeah, that's why you play the games, folks. And look, they've been able to yes, they've been able to take advantage of some of the other injuries that have happened in is in their own conference. Mm-hmm. But hey, somebody had to do it, right? Yeah, it, it, at this time of the year, it's all about who's the healthiest, who executes the best, especially down the stretch. As we talked about before, the playoffs are about matchups and adjustments. And by game three, everybody knows your plays. Everybody knows what schemes you're going to run. It's just who's who's who can execute. And who can adjust mm-hmm. if you can in time before you get beat? And the Phoenix Suns, as I said a, a couple of minutes ago, they have been the better team, uh, clearly the better team, period. Uh, like we, we've been saying, give the Clippers uh, all the credit for trying, but, you know, digging, trying to dig out of old 2 hole for the third time in, 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 a, in a playoff season, it, it's just not going to work. And so by the time we come back uh, to record in our next episode, the Phoenix Suns will be in the, West, in the NBA Finals, I should say. So, uh, Phoenix, uh, they were the better team in this series. Tip your heads off to them. We'll just see if, if they can if, – uh, if, if they can uh, – they'll wait to see if, they, if they'll play Milwaukee or Atlanta, which the series that we'll go to right now as we wrap up uh, this uh, first segment of Second City Sports. Along with Lakina, I am Sid. Uh, Lakina, game two. Uh, of course, we won't have to review that Milwaukee uh, gave the Hawks all they could handle. They blew them out by 25-plus uh, points. <laughs> they were they led by 40 at one point. Atlanta did what they had to do. They stole the first game from Milwaukee off their home court. Uh, game three from Atlanta uh, last Sunday was a total different story. Uh, the Bucks defeated the Hawks 113-102. to Chris Milton scored uh, a game-high 38 points, including 20 points in the fourth quarter. The first time a Bucks player has done that in the fourth quarter of a playoff game in the last 25 postseason appearances for that franchise. And there's a lot of historical names uh, that play for that Bucks franchise. Mm-hmm. Lou Alcindor, now Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Oscar Robertson, of course, Sidney Moncrief, Ricky Pierce. Uh, the list can go on and on. Terry Cummings, of course, Ray Allen, Glenn Robinson. So, Chris Milton's name is up there with some of those, uh, some of those other greats I just mentioned that played in the Bucks uniform. Of course, for Atlanta, Trey Young had 35 points, four rebounds, four assists, I should say, in a steal. Of course, he injured his ankle early in the game. Did not play in the fourth quarter due to incidental contact laying on his ankle with the referee. Like Hina, I, I, I'm not gonna. Milwaukee's going to win this series. Uh, we don't know what Trey Young's uh, status is for game four tonight, for those of you listening on, on the podcast. But even Trey Young plays tonight. Will it be enough for Atlanta? I don't know. I think they can still make this a series, but they got to win tonight or else. Because I don't see them winning a the game five in Milwaukee should they lose tonight on their home court again. They probably should have won game three, I think. If had, yeah, if, it was a very competitive first half. If you know, if, if Trey Young had not gotten hurt and some other mm-hmm. stuff that had happened, and you know, Chris Milton, look, I think you, you sh- I think Chris Milton is finally showing you that he is a formidable sort of like you know second guy to Giannis. Mm-hmm. We'll see if he can keep it up. I mean, there have been some times where he hasn't been able, hasn't been that guy. So we'll see what 
Well, you can do it. Like I said, I think look, Milwaukee's going to end up winning it. It's probably, I still say it's going to end up being Bucks and Six, and the Suns are probably going to have a mm-hmm. whole lot of time between now and the finals. And I, and I look, I think. I think the you know, guys need to step up for the Hawks, especially if Trey Young is not going to be at 100%. Capella, you need to step up. You only scored eight points. Bogdanovich, you missed too many threes, dude. I mean, come on now. You couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> really? Come on. Um, the Gallinari, look, his hair is actually starting to grow back, which, you know, thank goodness because that hair. <laughs> I had that same thought. I had that same thought watching the game on Sunday. I said, we're going to talk about this on, the, on this episode. Uh, he had the bad Mohawk as we teased about, about uh, doing this playoff run. But you notice his game has gotten better as soon as the hair started to grow back. Just I don't know if his teammates rasped him about it or what. Maybe, but maybe, maybe you notice his hair, uh, his, his game started to come around with his hair and full hair growing back. I, 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 look, <laughs> to mark my words, I think that's what it was, Lil Yo's. People, his teammates are probably insulting about his haircut, and they probably all told, "Look, you need to grow your hair out, dude." So as I said, he actually has to play. But like I said, he had 18 off the bench. So, but like mm-hmm. if, you, if you want, if you're Atlanta, if you want to push the Bucks, you probably no, you probably won't win the series. But the fact that you even made it this far, I think you should be very proud of yourself, in spite of everything that happened earlier in the season. But I think if you want to push the Bucks to the brink, I think this is the time to do it. And if you don't do it in Game Four tonight. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna be sent to a, 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 a vacation pretty quickly. So, you know, John Collins, he to step up. He had 13 points, but you missed some key mm-hmm. shots late. You know, Capella, what happened to you those last couple of minutes, dude? Where were you? Mm-hmm. Come on. So, I mean, you need to, you know, look. Need, you know, look Trey needs some help, especially if he's not gonna be at 100. percent He needs some help here, guys. Look, I think the the Hawks have shown that I think they found sort of the kinks with. With the Bucks, so the key is for them to try to kind of capitalize the, and minim, minim, and minimize Giannis, so that they'll have to depend on guys like Middleton and Tucker and Holiday. And also, too, before we close out this first segment, let's give a, a credit to a couple of role players for the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, starting center Brook Lopez, he added ten points, including off of four of six, of six shooting. Bobby, Bobby Portis, <laughs> uh, a former Chicago Bull, in, in seventeen minutes of action, he scored fifteen points, grabbed four rebounds. Pat Connaughton had some extended minutes in Game Four. He only scored five points, but he really brought the energy uh, defensively. He had a couple mm-hmm. of key stops late, and so. The, the Milwaukee Bucks role players are starting to step up. P.G. Tucker didn't have a good game, especially offensively, but you cannot ignore the role that he, he, that, that he has on this team, uh, uh, guarding the primary score, scorer uh, along with uh, adding some key buckets. So uh, the Milwaukee Bucks uh, role players are starting to, uh, to step up, and that's going to be one of the reasons why they're going to close out the Atlanta Hawks probably sooner rather than later. So probably when we get back, for our, uh, our next episode, that series, like you said, will probably be over too. So we may be doing an NBA Finals preview show. Who knows? But <laughs> sooner than we thought. But uh, let's give the uh, Bucks role players some credit too, as well. Oh yeah, it's totally definitely. I think you know, Wolf has you know he look he's made some key defensive stops. So look, he blocked KD. So uh, you know, so he has proven that he can do that. And look, let's hope they can keep it up. I mean. You know, Bobby Portis, I mean, who would have thought, right? He'd be probably be, you know, maybe perhaps maybe a couple of games away from playing in the NBA finals. But yeah, we'll see what they we'll see what they can do. I mean, like you said, Sid, we might be might be previewing the NBA finals by the time we reconvene on Friday. But should look, it'll be it look if it if it does end up being Suns and Bucks, I know no one really had that. I know none of us did early in these playoffs, but look, it is what it is. But it should be a fun, mm-hmm. you know, finals regardless. Yeah, we'll preview that series once it comes around. We'll take this 20-second timeout. You're listening to Second City Sports along with Lakina McGee, which is she. I ain't seen any brown this me. We'll have more sports and more fun uh, following this brief intermission. You're listening to Second City Sports. Welcome back to Second City Sports Zoom style. Zoom style. Along with Lakina McGee, which is she, I ain't Sydney Brown, which is me. You can follow your Shirley on the Twitter and the IG at CK80. Once again, at CK80, that's S I D K I D A zero, S I D K I D A zero. You can follow me at Keena McGee on the Twitter and at Keena Oscar McGee on the IG. You can follow this podcast, Second City Sports, uh, the video versions right here on YouTube at War Media. Once again, at War Media, W A R R Media, W A R R Media. You can follow our podcast at War on Anchor, 
We're available on all podcast platforms. Just type in that search engine box, W-A-R-R on Anchor. You can go to our website, weareregalradio.com. That's W-E-A-R-E-R-E-G-A-L radio.com. And you can follow us on all social media platforms at War Media. Once again, at W-A-R-R Media. Thank you in advance for your support. Like, share, subscribe, 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 and tell your friends. Yes. Lakina, let's continue the basketball talk. Of course, the uh, news broke over the weekend that uh, former NBA player in 2004 world champion with the Detroit Pistons and finals MVP, Mr. Big Shot Chauncey Phillips, <laughs> has now accepted a, a job uh, as being the head coach for the Portland Trail Blazers. For the moment, he'll coach Dame Dalla, as the kids will say. He's known to us regular folks as Damian Lillard. Of course, Damian Lillard will be part of the USA men's basketball team this summer. Uh, in the Summer Olympic Games in Tokyo. Of course, also a report that came out over the weekend that that stated that uh, that uh, Damian played a, quote, significant role in filling out the USA roster. Now, there has been speculation that uh, D- uh, Damian Lillard will use this uh, Olympic period to try to recruit guys to uh, come join him in Portland or per se, persuade management of the Blazers to trade him to, uh, to uh, any number of teams that needs his services. Lakina, we all know about the story about LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh from 2008, the Redeem team. Of course, originally it was supposed to have been Carmelo, Wade, and James going to Miami in summer of 2010. We all know what happened with that. Mm-hmm. Lakina, call me crazy. This, this may be a, a no-brainer here, but this may be a little bit harder than, than people uh, may think. I know Damian Lillard is a star in the NBA, especially with the young people and with him being a rapper. Mm-hmm. You know, he does some very good, clean rap. Yes. Nice but, PG-rated uh, rap. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, of yeah. course, you saw him do that at, here in Chicago at All-Stars uh, Saturday night uh, in front of a, a sold-out crowd that you see. But getting back to on-the-court basketball, Lakina, I know he's been a loyal guy throughout his whole career. I know I thought him and LaMarcus Aldridge would work out. It didn't work out the way the re- recently retired star, of course, Aldridge uh, left – for free agency a few years ago to go to San Antonio. But Portland, this goes to their management. Portland has not had a, a, a consistent start to go with Damian Lillard. I know they brought in Carmelo for the last couple of seasons, but we all know that Carmelo's on the back end of his career. CJ McCollum, he's a nice player, but he's not your number two. He's your number three on a good team at best. I know Portland's been suffering through injuries the last couple of years. I know a couple years ago, they made it to Western Conference Finals. However you want to feel about it, they made it there. But uh, I don't think that Portland will find – they can say they'll try to find a second – a formidable second, formidable second start to go with Damian Little. But I just don't see it. Now, will he get traded this summer? That still remains to be seen. Well, let's start with the, uh, with the Phillips thing for a second. I know some people in Portland were upset, and we know some people who we follow on Twitter were pretty upset that Becky Hammond didn't get the, the nod. And now they're bringing those stuff about what, you know, some stuff that happened with Billups years ago that was resolved. I, I, I don't, you're doing a disservice to both her and to Billups by bringing those stuff that happened in the past and that nothing came from it. And that's not good. That, that does not help, you know, showcase your point. And I think that's the worst thing you can do. And look, he might look, David might still leave. I mean, I know people are going to say, well, maybe Becky Head would have gotten him to leave. You don't know that. Look, he probably still wants to leave, even though Phillips is there now. So I want to get that part out the way because I I think that this is sort of like people want to try to bring up something just to try to bring someone else down just to try to lift their person up, which I think is wrong. And there's a reason why people say this whole Twitter mob thing is just ass nine and it's absurd. And I just wanted to bring Mm -hmm. that up. Now, as far as this is concerned, I mean, this could be hard for him for if if Dave is doing this. Excuse me. If Dave is doing this to sort of like try to see if he can get guys to – recruit and try to join him in Portland. It's going to be hard to do because, you know, we're calling off a pandemic. I mean, you know, when everything else has been sort of haywire and, and chaotic. And then also too, you've got some other stuff that's other parameters to happening. A lot of these teams are probably aren't going to be able to, they may have to get rid of maybe some of their guys or to get you. I mean, the Pelicans apparently, supposedly they may, they may, you know, trade Brendan Ingram and I think like the multiple first round picks that they got from a couple of trades with the AD trade and, a, and another trade too. Maybe I think the holiday trade. That's not going to be enough to get you Damian Lillard. It's not. 
We're going to mm-hmm. mortgage our future to try to get Damian Lillard? I mean, that's it, silly. So, I, I don't know. I think the whole thing is just dumb. And I think people, I, I, I don't, I, I feel like the Portland, the city of Portland sort of turned on Dave for something that's not really, he doesn't have a lot of control here. I know some people may think mm-hmm. he does, but he really doesn't. And it, it's just, I, I don't know. We'll just, we'll see what happens. But I just think at, at this point, everything's on the table. So I, I just, you know, I, I just feel, mm-hmm. I don't know how you feel about all this, Sid, but I just feel like that's sort of my two cents on it. Couple things here. One, I've been hearing that, we know there's some media members that want him to go to the Lakers. Here's the thing. The Lakers will have half their roster shed uh, this summer because mm-hmm. I have that team as free agents. The Lakers don't have enough pieces to get him. And with the one piece that they do have that could bring him back is Anthony Davis. And, and Anthony Davis is the future for the Lakers. And uh, after they signed that big contract, uh, we all know that LeBron James has two, maybe three good years of this left in him. Uh, good LeBron. Somebody that he doesn't get hurt again. I know this past season he had that ankle injury, which was devastating. But if you're the Lakers, you're not trading Anthony Davis. Heaven forbid LeBron gets hurt, hurt again or much worse, and you trade Anthony Davis, you're back to square one again. So that's not going to happen. I think Boston is a realistic possibility. We said Philly on, on our last episode, but yes, if you're Portland, do you want – you have to take Ben Simmons. Do you want to take Ben Simmons and build around – build around that you could but i don't know how you're going to sell that to your fan base if you're the blazers and if you're- milwaukee's out the question oh yeah and I, I know let me get this out the way <laughs> right now i think we said this on the last episode but let me say this again here to you bulls fans that want damian lillard trust me i want him on the bulls too but let's be realistic it's not going to happen stop it <laughs> They don't have a lot of stuff to to give to the to the mm-hmm. to the Blazers for Damian, for Dave. I mean, that's just not going to happen. You probably say Dallas, but again, do they have anything? I mean, you're gonna you want somebody to play with Luca, and apparently he and Porzingis don't get along. So mm-hmm. and that's not really a big shocker there. But again, that's another story. But you know, do you put him with mm-hmm. Dallas? If you're, if you're Portland, if you do trade him, are do you trade him? Just keep him in your conference. And trade it to maybe a probably Denver? not. I doubt it. So you're probably gonna go to maybe a Boston, maybe maybe Miami. I know our, our girl Alana Tekire would love that. I know she wouldn't mind that at all. <laughs> M- maybe Toronto, but you don't know what does Toronto what they're gonna be doing. I mean, are they gonna you know clean house and start over? They might get rid of Kyle Lowry, yeah. and m- maybe maybe Washington. But he'll have Washington. You'll have nothing to give to Portland. So mm-hmm. it's a lot of tricky things that are. Ha- it's a lot of tricky situations. So I I just. If he does get traded, which, again, everything's on the table, I just don't know where he can go. You just brought up a team that I didn't think about, Toronto. And I believe, like you said, Kyle Lowry, I believe is a free agent this summer. He is. I'm not sure. He I is, think okay. He is. I believe he is. So, but, but again, it will make common sense. But like you said, are they going to put a shooter around, uh, get a shooter in Toronto? With Damian Lillard, assume that he he's traded there. I'm sure if uh, um if if you're exploring that option of going to Toronto, obviously via trade, I'm sure uh, the name of Pasco Siakam will be brought up if you're Portland, and I will ask about him. But I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, like you say, you have another star with Dame and Pascal Siakam. I think that will work. But if you're Portland, you are you're gonna have to. Ask about Pascal Siakam if if, uh, if Toronto's management to uh, a side of jury tells you no uh, on Siakam, there's really nothing to talk about here. And will you, as we said on our episode, uh, will you get a third team involved to help that? I, as of right now, certain things that happen. As of right now, I just don't see it. And also, to back to the Pelicans for a second, it, you know, Brandon Ingram, and okay, you have like three or four first rounders. That's not, that's not going to be enough to get you, Damian. And who besides besides Zion, assuming if he stays, who is going to pass the ball to? You have nobody else there. Yeah. So I know I know a lot of Pelicans fans want that trade to happen, but if you're in Portland, do you take that? Is that equal value? I know I've seen people play with their little trade machine. You know those trade machines said that people yeah. are like. Yeah, let's put mm-hmm. this guy here and you know, let's see what you know, what happens. I guess I think one of the ones from Miami was I think Duncan Robinson, unfortunately, was one of those guys that was trained. I don't know if you know, our, our girl, a lot of went like that, but you know, 
But it's just, I, I just, at this point, I, I just don't see really anything happening here. Unless, like, unless, look, someone will come, you know, will come through with something. Like you say, like you said, so they may have to get another team and all that might be the only way you'll be able to make mm-hmm. this happen. They may have to throw in a couple of picks themselves, but I don't know. I just don't see it right now. I don't see it either. As I said before, stranger things have happened, but right now it just doesn't look promising for Damian Lillard. He can go to management and say, I, I want to be out of here. I know he's been a loyal guy throughout his whole career, but I, realistically, it's maybe two, maybe three teams he can go to because, because like you've been saying, Paul, let's not keep him and uh, train him to a Western Conference team, especially not to a contender. That's not, not going to happen. So, no way. Exactly. <laughs> you know, those two franchises have been bitter rivals ever since Portland uh, was uh, birthed back in 1970. So that's not going to happen. So you have to train him to the East. But we mentioned Milwaukee's out, Philadelphia maybe. Washington, that's not going to happen. Boston's a realistic possibility. Here's another team, and I just uh, this just popped in my head. I know it, uh, their sports radio station started this a couple weeks ago. I don't know how big they're going to start this, but, you know, New York Knicks fans are very passionate fans. Uh, they're going to ask again, can uh, now World Wide West uh, with the new management team and the New York Knicks, do they, they're probably next to Boston have the best assets to get Damian Lillard. It now did. you get Dame Dollar in a bigger market. If you're the league, you're happy. If you're the Knicks, you're happy. But will that be enough? Uh, if you're Portland, who, who do you get? For, if you're Portland, who do you want back? That's the question. That's the question. Do you get? Do you try to maybe get Reddish back and try to build around him? Do you? Are you going to have to maybe have to trade Julius Randle? You got. You know, so you got. You got first rounders, and that's fine. But mm-hmm. who else do you? Who else do you have? Who else can you give? I mean. I don't know. Like, uh, I, I can see where some people would say maybe the Knicks, but do they have anything that the that Portland will want? That's the million dollar question, right? Yeah, not- assuming, let's just say, uh, is Damian Lillard and Julius Randle, you, you still go ahead to find a shooter. Mm-hmm. And you still go ahead to find that, uh, that superstar because. Just those two, assuming those two players are on the same team, it's not going to be enough. I know the Knicks had a good season. I know the uh, people said that they were overrated, and they did take advantage of an underachieving bottom middle to bottom half bracket of the Easter Conference. I give them that. And Top Thibodeau is a hell of a coach. But just when just having Damian Lillard and Julius Reynolds is not going to be enough. Like you said, Lakina, well, who else are they going to get? Uh, the next one to trade for somebody else. Will they will they trade for Bradley Beal? Will it be Bradley Beal, Julius Randle, and Damian Lillard? Maybe that will work, but who knows? I'm trying to see like who else out east that he could go to. I mean, Miami, but like I said, you may have to you may have to trade in some of your your old guys to get him. Um, mm-hmm. Charlotte. I mean, I don't know if he wants because he's gonna want to play in Charlotte. Uh, maybe no. the Pacers. Maybe the maybe the Pacers. I said maybe because you got Rick Car- Carlisle over there now. You know, I know, I know he. And that Peter, wouldn't be bad. That, that wouldn't be bad. Field, yeah. That and would they, not be bad. Like I said, they have a head team. coach. Yeah. Like I said, you have Miles Turner, but yeah. I know you have Mal- assuming them, I know you have Malcolm Brockton, who's their point guard now. But right. Assuming that you trade, assume, but assuming that you trade him, assuming that you trade him. Right. Uh, you bring in another shooter or star in there, Damian Lillard, Miles Turner. That wouldn't be bad. I'm trying to think. I mean, like you said, with Philly, I mean, do you, if you're the Blazers, do you really want Ben Simmons come back? To come back with? No, no I don't think you're going to be able to do that. I, I, there's really, it, he's really limited on where he can go, basically, outside of the Western mm-hmm. Conference. Yeah. He's really, he's really limited, so I don't know. We'll see what happens as the um, offseason uh, off season arises after these NBA finals coming up next month. And, of course, with the Olympic Games starting up on July 23rd. You're listening to Second City Sports along with Lakina McGee. I am Sydney Brown. Lakina, I know the, uh, the, the Olympic trials for the track and field in uh, U.S. women's and men's gymnastics teams took place uh, last weekend. I caught a couple of clips of it, I know you watched the majority of it. What's your report? I mean, I'll start with the track and field for us since there's so much to cover with the track and field. I mean, I would say some <laughs> names to watch in the, on the 100 meters for both the men and the women, Shakari Richardson and Trayvon Bromwell. I think those two are going to be names that I really think that could 
get that 100 meter back. They're both the defending the world champions. So I think those are two people that I think has a good shot. I mean, of course, you have to deal with runners from Jamaica and Bahamas. I know that, folks. Relax. I know that. But uh, <laughs> I, I, think if, I think either one of them, I think, could probably pull it out for the U.S. I think they're both – they're both capable. Like I said, they're both defending world champions. I think, you know, Shakira Richardson, I think, has a great story, great backstory. So make sure you guys check out her story. And I look, I just think that they're both, both her and Brahma are very capable of perhaps, <clears throat> excuse me, weighing the 100 meters. Alice and Felix is back with the 400 meters, you know, her fifth Olympics. We all know what happened with her and just the unfortunate, you know, the fact that Nike dropped her after she had her baby, after nearly dying from giving birth to her daughter. And I think she's going to be a formidable contender in the 400 meters, no doubt. And Noah Lyles is a guy, he just won the 100 meters a couple of days ago on Sunday for the men. I think he's definitely a guy that, you know, if, look, and, and unfortunately for a lot of these guys and gals, I'll get to the masters in a second, but unfortunately, their family members aren't going to be able to go with them, with only mm -hmm. you know, with no one other than local you know Japanese um, spectators are going to be there. That's going to be a very different feel. So, for a lot of these you know athletes, you know, for their parents and family members, this is going to be the last time they're going to be able to see them until after the Olympics. So, just an unfortunate mm -hmm. situation <laughs> there, but. I'll go to the Masters for a second, too, of um, Simone Biles. Yeah, she had an off night on Sunday, but she won. She still won the, the trials, by like, all, like the over two and a half points. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather she would have these struggles now, instead of a month from mm -hmm. now. Suni Lee, who's, you know, someone who's going, went through injuries, she made the team. Um, Jordan Childs, who, you know, she almost quit the sport. You know, she trades with Biles. She almost quit the sport a couple years ago. She gets in on the the ladies gymnastics team um let's see who else made the gymnastics team um uh, so nisa lee i should say that's her name um there was another girl i forgot her name but yeah so what was i know you always saw a little brief you know sort of a brief you know with the, the trial with the, the track and the gymnastics what was what's your sort of like synopsis of all this uh, just looking at a couple of clips, I said, Simone Biles, please don't get her, because I believe she's going to tear it up the Olympics. Of course, she's, uh, we watched her in the last Olympics. She she won uh, every event with the gold medal, uh, except for one. So and we talked about this before. She's the greatest gymnast ever. Of course, we, we remember Lakina when we were telling our age. <laughs> uh, Dominique Dawes, Shannon Miller, of course, uh, Carrie Strzok, uh, Dominique Komenich, um mm -hmm. Uh, have her name correctly, and yeah, so we yeah. had the gymnasts through the yeah good. We had the gymnasts from the late nineties into the early two thousands dominating sport. We took a break, but now now it's been a resurgence these last two three Olympics. So I'm looking forward to watching the uh, women's gymnastics again uh, uh, this summer. But I wanted to ask you a question before we move on. What about the men's uh, track, at, U.S. men's track and field? Because I know Justin Gunn, I believe, called it quits because he finished as the runner-up to Usain Bolt, who also retired uh, from track and field uh, these uh, last two Olympics. I know Justin Gallant finished uh, as a runner-up these last two Olympics as uh, the fastest human in the world. Do we have anybody on the horizon in, in the U.S. men's? Trevor Bromo. I Let's just said it. Trevor Bromo. Yeah, he's a. Like okay. Said, he's okay. a guy that in the hundred meters, I think, could definitely be a good contender for the for him to um, win it for the men in the hundred meters. I really think he has a really good shot, and he's had a good head on his shoulders. And look, I think he's a defending world champion in that event, so I think he's definitely going to have his chance. I'm sure the Jamaicans are going to have some of their guys right there too, but I think Bromo definitely has a chance. Yeah. Noah, Noah Laz, I just said, you know, in the 200 meters, I think he's another guy that's the, you know, he hasn't really had a, a competed this year for a lot. For a lot of these track stars, they haven't really competed much this year, of course, because of the pandemic. So for a lot of these mm -hmm. guys, this is, this, is their first, this is their first competition this year. So, you know, on the outdoor side. So I think that helps. I think he really has a really good shot on the uh, women's 100-meter um, hurdles. You know, Sydney McLaughlin. You know, second place last year, the last Olympics, you know, she broke the world record in the trials for the 400 meter hurdles. Also, Delia Muhammad, who is the defending champion. So, yeah, I think those two are going to be mm -hmm. going at it. They may have, I think they have some competition um, around the world as well uh, outside the U.S., but I think those two have a really good shot of getting the gold back. So, look, there's, there, look there are a lot of, you know, great contenders in the, on the track side. I think in track and field, I think they have a really solid team with a good mixture of veterans and some young young people. So, I think they have a really good shot. They, 
will they dominate like they've done them in previous Olympics? Probably not. You know, it's going to be hard, but since the world's really caught up, but I think they have a really good shot to take it over some medals. Also, the gymnastics side too. I think, I think even the men's side. Mm -hmm. I think men may have a good shot at, at winning some medals. I think. Yeah, usually the uh, the U.S. men's hasn't been doing that that well in, in these last couple of Olympics. I know the women's, as we talked about, the women's U.S. women's gymnastics team has dominated over the last uh, three three four Olympics. So uh, hopefully the men can get their act together. We'll, we'll be cheering for them on, um, uh, watching here in the states. But like you said, Lakini, because only local spectators in Tokyo can only attend these events. No one else from around the world can attend these events due to the uh, pandemic. And so they had that rule. We're talking about the Official folks in Tokyo had their rule uh, placed in back in March. So uh, these Olympics should be fun. I'm looking forward to them, Lakina. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a, a record-setting Olympics worldwide because we didn't have it last year. And I think uh, on the side note, uh, how will the uh, spectators uh, – will it be like a March Madness crowd? Like uh, if someone should uh, from another country is gaining momentum, including – Whatever event, will they cheer for that particular team or individual? We shall see. And also, to the tape delayed stuff. I mean, like I've said, like yeah. we talked about the last few weeks, I mean, the fact that they're going to be here in Tokyo, United States, yeah. Especially this is going to be in Tokyo, like you said, Sid. Mm -hmm. It's about like, like, like a 12 hour, like a 13 hour mm -hmm. difference between here and Tokyo. So they're, gonna, they're ahead of us by about 13 hours. So it's going to be very interesting to see. I mean, you got social media, you got the Peacock app, like, you know, if you got the Peacock on your phone or on, yeah. your, on your device. Yep. So unfortunately, you're probably going to know who, who won these events <laughs> before NBC. No, stay off social media if you want to be, be yeah, surprised. Exactly. Yeah, so if you do not want to be surprised, stay off social media. That's all we got to say. <laughs> I mean, I always imagine, like, if 1980, if, um, the men's hockey team had been on social media back then, because remember, that was taped the way people forgot, forget yeah. that. So. Mm -hmm. You know, it's crazy. But, yeah, it should be an interesting Olympics. Like I said, we'll, we'll talk more about the Olympics as they get closer. But, you know, I think it's going to be very interesting, especially, you know, the how, how – especially the Olympic Village. How is that set up? I mean, are they going to have, you know, people yeah. who are vaccinated on one side? They're going to have non-vaccinated folks on the other side. I'm sure here in the U.S., I'm sure they're going to encourage all their athletes to at least get vaccinated so they don't have to worry about – If not already. If, if they're not, not vaccinated already. already. Yeah, we talked so, about it before. Yeah, yeah. so I, I don't know how it is going to be in other countries, but it's going to be very interesting, no doubt. All right, last story for today is comes to our good friends at Awful Announcing. MLB Taps Odyssey as the official podcast partner for exclusive audio content. Major League Baseball has expanded its podcast offerings beyond team-specific audio programming. The league is partner, partnering with Odyssey, which used to be known as Radio.com, to produce branded podcast content for MLB and its 30 teams. Odyssey now becomes the official podcast and audio partner of Major League Baseball. Odyssey, as I mentioned, formerly known as Radio.com or as Intercom, owns and operates 39 all-sports stations throughout the country, including here in Chicago, 670 and score, the flagship station of the Cubs, Boston Red Sox, WEEI, New York Yankees, WFAN, so on and so on. The Mia Conglomerate, <laughs> pronounce that five times fast, also <laughs> owns podcasts companies Pineapple Street Studios, hold to ESPN's 30 for 30, and HBO's Hard Knocks, audio companions and Cadence 13, whose shows include the Tony Kornheiser show, the GM shuffle with Adnan Verk and Michael Lombardi and both Richard Deutsch and Sports Illustrated Sports Media Podcast. Odyssey just launched a third podcast studio called 2400 Sports. Mm -hmm. The first cool. series produced by, yep. Yeah, the first series produced by MLB and Odyssey will chronicle the Cubs' run to the winning the 2016 World Series, highlighting the players and storylines from that season. In addition to following the regular season and postseason treks to breaking the team's 108-year championship curse. Future podcasts haven't been yet announced, but according to the official announcement from MLB, upcoming series will highlight fathers and sons who played in the major leagues in a travel show sharing the traditions and culture surrounding several MLB ballparks. Hopefully Kaminsky Park will be one of them. Odyssey will also work with each of MLB's 30 teams to develop exclusive content. In a partnership with MLB may produce concerts with showcase baseball events like the All-Star Game and World Series. Additionally, baseball content will also be featured in Odyssey's BetQL Sports Betting Network, which recently expanded to become the primary program on several stations. 
BetQL personalities and analysts will appear on MLB platforms and MLB content, including live game cut-ins and will appear on BetQL affiliate stations. Like, you know, this is another way for, uh, for uh, these uh, professional well, the four major sports in the United States to not just produce content, but get them out to their fan base. I expect the other three leagues to follow uh, follow suit. Lakina Baseball, as we talked about, they have a marketing problem, especially toward the younger fans, even though they're trying to do that with this pace of play. But this is another avenue that, as we said before, that uh, that fans and like us, uh, how we consume our products. It's just This is just another way, another avenue. Yeah, I think that this is a great way for baseball to kind of promote their product. And like mm-hmm. you said, Sid, I think, look, their Audacity has multiple networks all over the country. Of course, here in Chicago, we got 670, the score. So mm-hmm. it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's accessible, which is great. And I think it's successful for folks to listen, mm-hmm. whether you have the Audacity app, if you have you know, linear through the, 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 the regular station. So I think this is a nice way. And also, you know, chronicling the 2016 World Series for the Cubs. I think that's a great start and because it, it brought in big listener ratings for the score at the time. So I think this mm-hmm. is definitely a good way to kind of yeah, get jumpstart that project. And we'll see what more they have coming up because I think there are, there are a lot of teams and players that they can definitely switch up for. Yeah, and also how they present it as well, because as we mentioned, like, you know, the way that we receive and watch our content, uh, our content is different from where we grew up. It was just radio, TV, and newspaper slash magazines. It's no longer that we are living in a technology world. Uh, we're living through a, a world of not just social media, but smart our smartphones. You held up your phone earlier, uh, as George Offman, good friend of the program, said, a veteran Chicago sports reporter, Hall of Famer, by the way. He said he held his phone during our interview. He said uh, the, our phones changed the game. And also, too, with these streaming services, not just regular cable, but streaming services, uh, you can uh, watch highlights and condensed versions of games at any time. So this is another way to consume, like, uh, to, uh, to consume products. As I said before, and I'll say it again, people want and need options. People want and need options, and it's all around us now. And everybody knows how to look. My, like, I've said this before. My mom is the least tech savvy person in the world, but she actually knows how to get to some of her streaming services now on her on her um, television. So she can actually do that now. And I think I think it's good to see that some of these leagues are starting to follow suit. I think, like I said, I don't I don't doubt that other leagues like NBA, the NHL, NFL, especially. Oh, I'm sure that, I think they're already doing it now with the NFL. But uh, look, I think all. But then, like you said, they all need options. People are still going to want to listen to stuff the, the traditional way and watch stuff the traditional mm-hmm. way. So, you know, some people are going to be setting their ways, and, and, and look, that's fine. That's within their right. So, I think it's going to be mm-hmm. very interesting to see what they do with this because I think that what what kind of content that what more content are they going to have available on this? Yep, it's all about having options and having quality content for your uh, listeners and viewers to uh, pay attention to. That's going to put a wrap on this edition of Second City Sports. Along with Lakina McGee, I am Sydney Brown. You can follow yours truly on the Twitter and the IG at CK80. Once again, at CK80, that's S-I-D-K-I-D-A-0, S-I-D-K-I-D-A-0. Oh, and also, too, one more quick note before we wrap up. Um, Chris Chelios will join Mark Messier as part of their ESPN studio team lineup. That's going to be a very interesting lineup. They, Andrew Marshall made that announcement on his website on the, New, on the New York, his media column on the New York Post a couple of days ago. Um, he joined guys like Kevin Weeks to answer your question. Uh, said Kevin Weeks that he's already been hired to be mm-hmm. the you know studio game manager. Also Leah Hextall. For those of you who don't know, that's that's uh. Ron Hextall's, uh, I believe that's his niece, if I'm not mistaken, but she has, she has a great resume in her own right, calling NHL games and hockey games for like like 17 years now, so she's got the resume for it. So things are starting to come together with ESPN and Turner and their hockey coverage. Yeah, this should be, this should be exciting coming uh, uh, next season for the fall. You can follow me at Keenan McGee on Twitter and at Keenan Oscar McGee on the Insta. You can follow this podcast, Second City Sports, right here on YouTube at War Media. Once again, at WARR Media. Videos drop every Monday and Friday to get a sneak peek. Videos drop every Monday and Friday right here on YouTube at War Media. Once again, at WARR Media. 
You can listen to the audio version of this podcast at War on Anchor, once again at W-A-R-R on Anchor. We are available on all podcast platforms, including the iHeartRadio app. Make sure you type in those search engine boxes on those podcast platforms, W-A-R-R on Anchor. You can go to our website, weareregalradio.com. That's W-E-A-R-E-R-E-G-A-L radio.com. And you can follow us on all social media platforms, including right here on YouTube at War Media. Once again, at W-A-R-R Media. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you very much for your support. Like, share, subscribe, 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 and tell your friends. Yes, for Lakina, I'm Sid. This, is, has, this has been another fun-filled edition of Second City Sports. We will see you next time. Until then, holla! Stay safe, guys.